Welcome to WHBC TV. I'm Dr. Tado Boye. I greet you with Christ's joy. The psalmist says this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we'll be glad in it. And we're rejoicing in the victory that Jesus Christ has won for us right from the beginning in the book of Genesis chapter 15. We see that God was going to provide for us a restorer in the seed of the woman, the Zerah of the woman. And that one and only one is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who is risen and because of him we have the victory in jesus mighty name amen oh i got a word for you this morning i got a word for you this morning and we're glad that you're watching would you continue to join us as we worship and declare this victory that jesus christ has won for us and we continue on in part two of our message we began on the first sunday of the year entitled do it again do it again part two hey why don't you let's go deep into the word of god Come with me to Genesis chapter 2 and we're going to go to 1st Chronicles and we're going to go to Luke and then we finish off in the book of John hey, and then in the book of Acts as we see the great comeback of all times. Hey, it's going to be good. Stay tuned. I'll come back and pray with you in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive the word. The year was 1929. Georgia Tech was playing their arch rivalry UCLA at a Rose Bowl. A guy by the name of Roy Riggles was playing for the UCLA team at that game. And as you can imagine, he stood in front of thousands of crowds and he couldn't believe that he of our players would get a starting position in a Rose Bowl game. Being a sophomore in a Rose Bowl game on the same football stadium against the famous, famous Georgia Tech. As they took to the field, the score was 0-0. Now, if you know the game of football, you'd know a no tackle. Adam, no. You know a no tackle like Roy Riggles doesn't get to touch the ball at all. No tackles are the big, the huge, big 325 pounds guy that you see on the TV. Their job is to knock people like Adam down who are running with the ball. But as the game progressed, all of a sudden a player uh, on Georgia Tech picks the ball, running for a 15-yard first down and got, got, got hit. He got hit by, by a, a linebacker on the UCLA team and he, he fumbled the ball and the ball fumbled and, and it just landed and bounces right into the hand of Roy Riggles. A big 325 pounds guy with a ball in his hands at a Rose Bowl. A moment of glory. Here he was with, with the ball. A nose tackle. Remember, a nose tackle don't get to hold the ball in a game. What they do is they hit you with the ball. A moment of glory. He was running with the ball. He just pictured this 325 guy running with the ball. And two players from Georgia Tech came and they just came charging at him. And Roy Riggles dodged them. And, and all of a sudden, there was just the field was wide open before him. And he was just going for the touchdown. And the crowds were screaming. And all the players in the sideline were running. Uh, they were still in the sideline, but they were running too. And they were just screaming. And, 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 and here... One of his own player, Benny Lamb, 
was screaming, running after Roy Ruggles. And Roy was thinking, what in the world? What in the world? Why are they screaming at me? Can they see I'm going for the touchdown? So as it got to the two-yard line, before the end zone, his own player, Benny Lamb, tackled him down. Because guess what? Roy Riggles was running the wrong way. He was going for a touchdown at his own end zone. Caroline know what I'm talking about. Be, be, because of the blunder, because of the blunder, Georgia Tech went on to score and, and, and at half time, all the player, players were in the locker room and it was dead silent. And you could see Roy Riggles as the story was told, sitting in the corner, embarrassed, totally embarrassed. Can you imagine Adam running? <laughs> he won't leave it down. Not only with his team, he won't leave it down with me, his daddy. <laughs> and the coach walked in that morning, that afternoon, and he says to all the players, gentlemen, It's half time. The game is only half over. And it's not over yet. I want all the same players that started to go back and start in the second half. And everybody got up except Roy Riggles. Still sitting down there moping. And the coach came to him, put his hand in his shoulders and said, Roy, did you hear me? I said the game is not over yet. It's only half over. And I said all the same players that started, including you, get back on the field. And history tells us that Roy Riggles went back into that game that day and he played the greatest game of his entire career. Even though he will forever be known as the wrong way Riggles. Oh, somebody, you came in here this morning feeling like wrong way, Riggles. In your moment of glory, you had the chance to hold on to the ball because somebody had fumbled their ball. So you picked up that dream again. You picked up that job. You picked up that marriage. You picked up that business. You picked up that ministry. You picked up that relationship. And here you are, here you are running, running with what you've picked up. Only to discover that you've been running the wrong way. And life has you tackled down. And like wrong way wriggles, you're sitting in your morass. You're sitting in your morass of failure, having yourself a good old pity party, saying to yourself, what use is it? It's over. No, the Lord sent me here to tell you it's not over yet because the Lord, your coach, the Lord, your hope, the Lord, your restorer is here in this room this morning saying to you, Adam, Sam, Peter, Callum, it's not over yet. Go do it again. Because the game is not over until it's over. I was going to say the game is not over until the fat ladies. <laughs> it's only half of the game. It's only first half of your life. It's only first half of my life. And it's only first half of Wemmer's life. And we all have another half to play in Jesus' name. Somebody shall do it again. Oh, somebody will feel your strength is coming back to you right now. And you feel it in your spirit. Somebody in here, if you feel the Holy Ghost fire of revival 
burning deep down in your soul as you were singing this morning and you can see the dead coming life again go ahead and take 30 seconds and give the lord your do it again praise right now praise him praise him like you know it praise him like you feel your strength coming back praise him like you feel your restoration praise him like you feel your hope praise him You may be seated, you may be seated. My brothers and my sisters, as we come to our text this morning, I shared with you last Sunday that our God is the God of restorations. Hello, somebody. And no matter how much you've blown it, and no matter how much you've fumbled the ball, there's always another chance for a comeback. Anybody in here glad that the Lord has given you another chance in 2018 to do it again? So I shared with you last Sunday that the first requirement for a great comeback, not just a comeback, Dickie Neal, but a great comeback. Oh, yesterday, how many of you watched the Raptors game? Oh, uh, Callum, Callum, wasn't that a great comeback? They lost, but that was a great comeback. To be able to come back like that with Golden State uh, at a 20, 29 point deficit. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling my pores. <laughs> I'm not just talking about a comeback, Dickin Kuma. I'm talking about a great comeback. And I share with you that the first requirement for a great comeback is number one, put it up. You've got to be tenacious. Oof. I'm wondering. How many never said that people do I have in this sanctuary this morning? Oh, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, oh, you've been beaten. I know you've been beaten. I know you've been bloodied by life and by the enemy of your soul. But you're still here singing. I'm a survivor. I'm going to make it. I'm not going to give up. I'm a survivor. Ooh, ooh, I, I forgot I'm, I'm, I'm in church. I, I feel like destiny child this morning. Come on now. But the fact is that you made it through all the impossibilities of 2017 ought to say something about you and about the God you serve. Some of us don't give ourselves enough credit like we ought to. Now Paul says, don't think highly of yourself. More than you need to. But he doesn't say, don't give yourself credit where credit is due. The fact that you're still sitting here. Through all that you went in 2017. Some people would have lost their mind. But you're still here. Ought to say something about you and the God in you. Oh, I lost somebody. Oh, I better get on with this message. I, I know, Carolyn, we often blame Adam and Eve for a lot of things that's gone wrong with humanity. You, you, you know, we, we just like to be, be, blame our parents for everything. Um, anybody? If it wasn't for my mama, if it wasn't for my daddy, I wouldn't have my toenails. Because we inherited their DNA, their sin nature, and then we keep passing that sin nature, that warped DNA, we keep passing it down from one generation to another generation to another generation. See, parents, parents, where are my parents here? Where are my parents at? Let me, let me hear you. Parents, this is the problem with raising up children. The problem with raising up children is you're fighting your own genes. <laughs> oh, 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 you're not hearing me. You want your kids to turn out like their mommy and their daddy. But they got you in them. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not going to even press any charges on you on that one. I'm just going to move on. <laughs> 
So as we come to chapter 4 of Genesis, we've discovered that the fruit, the fruit of the sin that Adam and Eve, the fruit that they were contending with, the fruit of the sin they were contending with in chapters 4, is the consequences of the root of the sin they committed in chapter 3. The root followed the fruit. And I know we often blame Adam and Eve for the root of the sin in Genesis 3. But if there's one thing we ought to be thankful to our first parents for in Genesis 4, Dick and Neil, is their spirit of tenacity to do it again and not just give up and die. And parents, by the way, that's, that's a spiritual gift. That's a good gift we ought to give to our children too. That they can see in us that the spirit of tenacity, never die attitude, we need to give them too. Am I already teaching somebody here this morning? I'm, I'm very careful. As transparent as I want to be for my children, I'm very careful that, I, that, that when, when, when my life is going crazy, that they still see that there's hope and I serve a God of restoration. And I, I say that to them every day. When there's life, there's hope. They're watching. They're watching you. They're watching you to see how you're reacting to the pressure that come. They're watching you to see how you're reacting to the all of life. They're watching. Because one day, monkey is going to see. I'm not saying you're monkey. <laughs> Our text says in Genesis chapter 4 verse 25, that after Adam and Eve's first attempt with their son, Cain, their first son, and after their second attempt with their other son, Abel, failed because they both killed each other. Albeit the promise of the seed that was given to them in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 still stands. That one day, A restorer was going to come out of a seed. After two failed attempts, Janet, one would have thought that Adam and Eve would never do it again. But verse 25 of Genesis chapter 4 says, Adam had relations with his wife. Again. Come on, church, help me. Again. Meaning, they did it again. Oh, look at that neighbor again who look like he or she needs to do it again and tell them they did it again, they did it again. And she gave birth, keep reading. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of. Good God of heaven. After the first attempt and the second one at it, now the third go at it, Adam and Eve did it again. No, oh, you're not talking back to me this morning. You're too quiet. And the verse says she gave birth to a Seth. Oh, Seth. Mm. Seth, Seth, Seth. Last Sunday, I told you to come back this Sunday so I can talk to you about Seth. And now that you're here, let me talk to you about Seth. Mm. Seth. Seth in Hebrew 
means substitute substitute in place of see, see that in verse 24 25 he, he, she told us the translation of the name in place of god has given me another offspring in place of god has given me another offspring seth mm, 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 mm. that's divine restoration for you right there i don't know who this is for i don't know what you've been through i don't know how bad you've been but god's word to somebody here this morning is, he will give you back double restoration son, for all the trouble you went through and for all that the enemy has stolen from you and for all the years hey, as jewel joe give me joe joe chapter 2 verse 25 our theme verse for the year of restoration says he will give back to you and restore to you the years that the locust has hidden and the canker worms and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and it says he will give them all back to you if you will do it again somebody holler at yourself and say do it again i saw you doing that i saw you when we were praising you were hollering at yourself do it again. I like that spirit. Somebody all at yourself again. I said, do it again. Do it again. You know, Lady Sherry, every once in a while, we got to have a self-talk. Everybody else is talking to you except yourself. Oh, come on now. Come on now. Shinene is talking to you. Big Mama and them are talking to you. But the only one that is not talking to you is you. And I told you that the only one that will stop you from your restoration is you. Ah. R write this down, write this down. Give me the life point. Give me the life point. Isaiah, you're doing well. Write this down, write this down. Your Seth, life point, your Seth is, re represent, is a replacement. Your Seth is a replacement from God. Write it down. Your Seth, my Seth, is a replacement from God. Seth is a divine restoration of what you have lost to the enemy. Meaning, Dickie Neal, when you do it again, ah, this is so good, this is so powerful. When you decide to do it again as you were speaking to yourself while we were praising, God himself is obligated to do it again too. Ah. Meaning, when you do, then God do. D does anyone in here know that if Adam and Eve had not done it again, Seth wouldn't have been born? And if Seth hadn't been born, your Messiah and my Messiah, Jesus, wouldn't have been born? Oh. Because it was going to be through Seth and in Seth that Jesus, our Messiah and Restorer, would come. Oh, can I take you deeper? Can I take you deeper? Look at First Chronicles chapter 1 with me. Go to First Chronicles chapter 1 in your Bible. A juicy one is coming. A juicy one is coming. Tell your neighbor a juicy one is coming. A juicy one is coming. First Chronicles chapter 1. Go there quickly. First Chronicles after Second Kings. Hallelujah. I, I don't know what, what your yeah, what the, 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 the title of your section says. As you open to First Chronicles, the title of the section in my Bible says Genealogy from Adam. All right. So, you need to understand that this is a list of family names of people in the Adams family. Okay. So that centuries later, centuries later, when this chronicles was being written, chronicling 
the generations of people from Adam, we read in verse 1. Let, let's read verse 1 together, okay, in unison at the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Adam, stop there. That's all I want you to read. Who would you have expected to come next in line after Adam? No. This is sons, not husband and wife. Who would you have expected? And? But who do you see come next? Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, you didn't say. Oh, you didn't say. Church, I came to tell you this morning. On this glorious morning, when Satan thought, when Satan thought, if you should go after the seed of the woman, Cain and Abel, in Genesis chapter 4 by killing them, and thinking it would thwart the plans of God, in Genesis 3.15, but what Satan did was he was dead wrong because while he was laughing at the news of Abel's mother, and while the demons were dancing and having a hell of party in hell, singing na 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 na, yeah, hey, hey, goodbye, Abel, na na na. While they were thinking the game was over, for Adam's helpless race, was Satan's blind sight was, is, he didn't know that we serve a God of second chance, a God of a third chance, a God of restoration. And he didn't know that the King, the Lord of glory, still has one more move. One more move. Checkmate devil, not stalemate, but checkmate devil. See, Satan didn't know as of yet and I put as of yet in my in my note to remind me that this is still the beginning those of you my school of women school of ministers and our theology class you know this is still the beginning so a lot of things are unfolding for us in this new beginning in the book of Genesis so Satan didn't know as of yet that we serve the God of restorations who will give you back what he, the enemy, has stolen from you. Because here comes Seth. Here comes Seth. Here comes Seth. And centuries later, Nancy, centuries later, Sister Nancy, New Testament will tell us, after the Chronicles was written, the New Testament will tell us that it was through Seth that Jesus, our Messiah and Restorer, will come to us. Oh, can I teach you these things some more? Before I give you my second requirement? Okay. Okay. Watch this. Turn in your Bible quickly to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. Quickly. Beginning in verse 23. Chapter Luke. Luke, Gospel of Luke. Oh, thank you. It's already there. So, 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 if you go to the book of Luke now, chapter 3, you tell me what the title of the section of that verse 23 says. Mine says the genealogy of Jesus. Is that what yours says too? Genealogy of Jesus. Good, good, good. So, so, so this is now the genealogy of Jesus as recorded for us, Marie, by Dr. Luke. Verse 23. Verse 23 says, as, begin, as he begins to read the genealogy, he said, when he began, he, that is Jesus, began his ministry. Jesus himself was about 30 years of age. Being as was supposed. Oh, there's a message all right there in there. So. Being as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Meaning, Joseph wasn't Jesus' daddy. Jesus was born the unique 
virgin birth son of God. That's what he's saying to us there. Okay, so keep reading. And he said, being the son of Joseph, supposedly the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, and, and Dr. Luke went down this genealogical list of the son of, the son of, the son of, for 15 more verses. 15 more verses, Mary. Until it comes to verse 38. Give me verse 38. And it says, verse 38, the son of Enosh, Come on. The son of? Whoa. Who is next? No, no, no. Go back. The son of Enosh, who is next? Then the son of Adam. The son of God. Not the son of Cain. Not the son of Abel. Because it won't matter what the enemy has done to Eve. <laughs> It, it won't matter through a first attempt and it won't be through a second try that the restorer and messiah would come but the seed of the woman the zera of the woman that was promised in genesis chapter 3 verse 15 would come through mother's eve's third attempt and that is why this morning on the second sunday of the new year I came to tell the hell in your life to blow out their candles to drain the swamp Amen. oh I wasn't talking for Donald Trump but I'm saying the enemy swamp that has been drowning you all these years is about to be drained in the mighty name of Jesus cause the blood bought washed people of God at Wemaha the Holy Ghost filled people of Wamaham are about to do it again. I, I, I find the person next to you and say, I'm going to do it again. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. In my, in my Jesus name, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to dream again. I'm going to hope again. I'm going to risk again. I'm going to love again. I'm going to praise God again. I'm going to believe again. I'm going to dance again. I'm going to be happy again. I'm going to do it again. Oh, weeping may endure for the night. Ah, but joy, 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 joy. Ooh. I shed some few tears this week. I shed some few tears this week because of the news that just came to me, left, right, and center. I said, weeping men, dear for the night. But joy, joy, joy. Oh, I better move on. I better move on. But doing it again, doing it again, doing it again may mean also, give me the light point, the lifeline, lifeline this time. Doing it again may also mean that you have to risk it again. Did you write that down? Isaiah, lifeline. Doing it again may also mean you have to risk it again. Come on now. Don't you know nothing ventured is nothing gained? If you don't risk anything in life, you won't get anything in life. Somebody here in this year, year of restorations, I'm giving you practical application now. It may mean you're going to have to risk getting into a relationship again, even though you've been hurt the first time you were in one. For another person, it may mean you're going to have to risk stepping out into a new ministry or a new business enterprise again, even though you failed at the first 
and the second time around. You would have to let God. You would have to let God. Listen to me very carefully. To know his people and to take you closer to him than you've ever experienced. Who, who is this message already empowering this morning? Which leads me to my second requirement, which is a flow, which is a flow out of the first. Number two, you've got to take your dead dreams to Jesus. Hey! I say you've got to take your dead dreams to Jesus, the restorer. You all know Simon Peter, don't you? In the New Testament. Anybody here don't know Peter? You all, you all remember Peter? Impetuous Peter. Foot in my Peter. Bold, tenacious Peter. The same Peter that Jesus, that, that said to Jesus, Lord, even if everybody left you, ain't gonna leave you. Thomas here is a doubter. He may keep doubting. Matthew here, he may have a cold feet. But I, Jesus, I'm your man. I'm your boy. <laughs> your ride or die. Anybody here ever told you they're with you? <laughs> hey, pastor, I'm with you, man. I'm your boy, your ride or die. You're still riding, but you can't see the you can't see the dying. Oh 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 oh! oh. You, the the die the die just jumped out of the car and took off. You know what happened? A few hours after Peter said to Jesus, "I'm your ride or die." A servant girl. Ah, see, God is going to use the least person. To humble you. It, 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 the Bible said be very careful because pride goes before. A little seven girl. See, people are watching you. People are watching you at work and you don't even know it. You're saying you're a disciple of Jesus and you're saying a Christ, you're a Christian. People are watching you to see what a Christian is. At the place you're working. Oh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you better live right and walk right because you cannot malign that name and go free on the day of judgment. I'm just, I'm just telling you right now because everything is going to be open before the Lord. And you don't want to hear him say, I do not know you. Watch this. Little did Peter know that a little servant girl was watching him as he was going with Jesus all through Galilee and they were doing the miracles and all that, you would think all eyes would be on Jesus. You would think all eyes would be on Jesus. Who would ever thought that a little girl would take Peter out of the equation and said, I know you. You too were with that Jesus of the Galilee. And the Bible tells us, Peter started cursing the girl out, <laughs> swearing and cursing that he didn't even know Jesus. Look here, girl. Blankety blank, don't know blankety blank what you're talking about. Three times he denied Jesus. And Matthew says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 75, and Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said before a rooster crows. You will deny me 
three times. And he, that is Peter, went out and wept bitterly. Lord, have mercy. L let me ask you, have you ever failed your Lord? <laughs> oh, oh, I, I know you love him. But that very thing you swore to yourself you never do again to grieve is your Savior's heart is the very thing you end up doing. Oh, Paul says in Romans chapter 7 verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not do, ah, and now you feel like a lousy failure. You feel like wrong, wrong way wriggles. Sitting down moping at the ball you fumbled. And you feel like walking away from it all. Because this walking with Jesus thing is more than you bargained for. Is, is there anybody in here who knows what this preacher is talking about this morning? Because if you do, and like Peter you failed your Lord again then I got good news for you. And the good news is, our God, who is the great restorer in the Old Testament with Adam and Eve, is still the great restorer of the New Testament with Peter and Thomas and with Ty and Mabel and Dathlin and Neil and you. If you would take your dead dreams to Jesus again, he says to tell you, it will restore you again. Somebody shout, it will do it again. Amen. Come, come, come with me. Come with me. Come with me. Look at what look at what Peter did with his dead dream in John chapter 21. Quickly. I'm almost done. Beginning in verse 1. Let's see what Peter did. Let's see what Peter did. Ah, hallelujah. This is so good. In the old testament, in Genesis chapter 1. Chapter 3, verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Eve said, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And in verse 24, when she did it the third time, he said, God has appointed me. See, see, when you do, God will do. Watch this. This is where, when Peter decided to take his dead dream back to Jesus, watch what God did with it. Hey, verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again. Somebody say again. again. <laughs> to the disciples. Oh, he will do it again for you. Your story isn't finished yet. Mm. John is speaking of Jesus here in verse 1. As the resurrection and the life. This is after the resurrection. It says Jesus manifested himself again. <laughs> and that is why I'm saying to you that if you want what you have that is dead to come alive again in 2018 as you're singing your year of restorations. You need to bring it to the one who was once dead himself. But now it's a life. And he will bring your darkness and deadness back to life again. Oh, oh, I, 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 I'm wondering, do I still have some people in here who are waiting for their restoration? Keep reading, verse 1, verse 1, verse 1. And Jesus manifested himself again to disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself this way. We're going to see which way now. Because Jesus came. In my study, as I'm reading this, I go, why did Jesus manifest himself again? You got to, again, I teach you to dialogue with your passage. Don't just read it. So he said he manifested himself again. There's something about that again. So why would Jesus show up again? I was asking myself. We're going to see why. I believe Jesus came here to show himself to Peter for one reason. And one reason only. Jesus didn't come for John. Jesus didn't come for Thomas. He already came for Thomas in chapter 20. When they were in the upper room. 
Jesus came for one person and one person only, for Peter. Watch this. Oh, this is good. Verse 2. They were together. Verse 2. Simon Peter and Thomas and all the disciples with him. Verse 3. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Stop there. Now, what's Peter saying here? Was Peter bored? And so he thought the best cure for his boredom is to go fishing like some of men do, some of us men do. I don't think so. Because the Greek word, the Greek word for go in, in verse 3, is the word upago. Ever say upago? The word means to go back to something. It's the same word, Francois, is the same word that Jesus used in John chapter 14, verse 28, when Jesus said to the disciples, I go to the Father. I upago to the Father. Is the word that means you're going to something or you're going back to someone. The meaning of this word, ladies and gentlemen, is more than my wife saying to me, Ty, I'm going shopping. Why? Because I already know that my wife has the spiritual gift of shopping. <laughs> I already know she was born to shop. So, 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 so she won't be announcing to me, Sarah. She won't be announcing to me, Ty, I'm going shopping because that's not new. All I need to do is check the credit card statement when it comes and I'll know what she's been shopping. The point I'm making is the rest of the disciples with Peter already knew Peter loves fishing. So it's not a news for them, for Peter to say, I'm going fishing. He was a fisherman. So what does Peter mean when he says to them, I'm going fishing? Watch this. Oh, this is so good. Watch this. Give me the lifeline, Isaiah. You're doing well. The lifeline, lifeline. What Peter was saying to them is this. Huh. When you fail, go back to the place you first started. Hey. Let me say that again. When you fail, go back to the first place you started. Oh, that's good, that's good. Isn't it true that when people don't know what to do, they do what they know to do? When you don't know what to do, and people say, oh, pastor, I don't know what to do. I know what you're going to do. You're going to do what you know to do. Peter has failed his Lord miserably. This is Peter who is doubting himself now, not Thomas. He knew he had betrayed Jesus. And he also knows that if you could go back and do it again at the place where he foresaw the light, where all the burdens of his heart rolled away, where there by faith he received his sight. Oh, you're not hearing me. Peter knew, Peter knew if he could go back and do it again where he first met Jesus at the Sea of Galilee. That same Jesus will show up and he too will do it again. Oh, I better quit this message. I better quit this message. I feel something moving me this morning. <gasps> let, let me ask you. Let me ask you. Watch this. How did Jesus knew that Peter and the other disciples will be at the same spot? Where it all got started. Did you hear what I just said? How did you know? How did Jesus knew they were going to be there? Uh, if not because Jesus, the great restorer, knew also that he had an unfinished work to do in restoring Peter back to himself after the denial. Because verse 4, give me verse 4. Verse 4 tells us that Jesus came 
and he just stood there waiting. Hey! Jesus is standing right now waiting for somebody. He just stood there waiting. How did Jesus knew that they were coming there at that same spot when they first started? And Peter said, if I can just go back to where I first saw the light, to where the burdens of all my hearts rolled away, to where that by faith I received my sight, I know Jesus will be there too. Oh, I don't know who I'm speaking to today, but I feel like I need to tell somebody here, sitting here or watching on WHBC TV, that whenever you have a dead dream in your hands and you feel like a total loser, the one thing you can do is take your dead dream back to Jesus where you first met him, where he gave you that, dead, that dream in the first place. Because I came to testify to you this morning that on that some sweet day, on that some sweet morning, you will see Jesus give you back your dream again why why because he is the resurrection and he is the life somebody holler yes he, yes he is if i had time which i don't i would have showed you that everything that happened to peter afterwards in john chapter 21 verses 6 to verse 14 was like deja vu all over again. The one who didn't cut any fish in verse 3 now was catching uh, a load of fishes, if that's a good word, in verse 6. Does that remind you of what happened at the first time when Jesus saw them in Luke chapter 5 in, on the Sea of Galilee? Anyhow, I'm almost done. When Peter and Jesus finally sat down to have a come to Jesus talk to have a come to Jesus meeting after Peter's betrayal before the crucifixion what do you suppose Jesus said to Peter Peter you're fired Oh, Donald Trump knows how to do that one better. And he would do it, he won't flinch. Neil, you're fired. And he won't even flinch. Jesus could have written Peter off for denying him like that so vehemently three times. But oh, praise God. I said, oh, praise God. For his second chance, for his third chance, for his fourth chance, for his hundredth chance to do it again. Anybody in here grateful that God would give you a second chance in 2018 to do it again? Look, 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 look at verse 15. Look at verse, verse 15 as we finish. Jesus didn't say, Peter, you're fired. Verse 15. No, he asked Peter. Peter, do you love me? More than this. Again, he asked him in verse 16. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Verse 17, for the third time. Simon! Son of John. He didn't call, if I had time, I would tell you why he didn't call him Simon Peter. He called him by his old name. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three times Jesus asked Peter the same question. Why? Wouldn't one time have been enough? No, no, ladies, ladies, help me out here. Help your boy out here, ladies. You know how a grown man would react to you 
if you ask a brother the same question three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you, what do you think? I'm? <laughs> watch this, watch this. Let me ask you, in case you've forgotten, how many times did Peter deny Jesus? Watch this. So for each time Peter denied Jesus, each time Jesus restored Peter back, when he says to Peter, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. I know you think you're a failure, but I'm not finished with you yet. Feed my sheep. I know you think it's over, but the game is not over yet. Feed my sheep. I know you think, oh, I don't know who this message is for this morning. But I just came to tell you, if Jesus would give Peter three times restoration for the three times denial, then I said to you this morning, Oh, thank you, Jesus. I don't know who this message is for. I don't know who this message is for. I don't hear me very carefully. Stand up on your feet. Because if you keep sitting, I'm going to go on. I'm not saying for one minute that your sin and your failure doesn't grieve the Savior's heart. Because it does. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying, with God's love, there's a grace. There's God's grace. Grace that pardon and cleanse with Him. Grace, grace. Marvelous grace. God's grace, grace that is greater than all our, oh, if that grace doesn't make you to jump out of where you are right now, like Peter jumped out of the boat and began to swim to Jesus, toward Jesus, if that grace doesn't want to make you jump out of where you are right now and come to Jesus, then I don't know what would move you. But somebody here, if you feel the strength of God coming back to you this morning because of this message you just heard, and you feel that your restoration is coming back to you, and life is coming back to you, and spirit is being breathed into you, take 30 seconds and give God your restoration praise right now. If you feel his grace, praise him like you feel his grace. Amen. Praise him like you feel his power overflowing. Yes. Zion, praise him. Yes. Well, I'm a praise him. Praise God. Awesome. What a mighty God we serve. What a powerful word. The word of God is still living. What God did before, he can do it again. Hallelujah. When you do it, God will do it. And this morning we went to part two of our message entitled, Do It Again. And the first requirement is you got to be tenacious and then today we see the second requirement which is you got to bring your dead dream back to jesus the restorer hallelujah we saw what he did for peter and what he did for peter and what he did for adam and eve this morning i declared over your life that in the mighty name of jesus you shall overcome and you will be restored again to where you need to be oh father we thank you for that person who is watching this morning no matter how much they have failed no how much out they messed up lord we thank you that you're god of a second chance that you have won the victory for them and so we need to walk into the victory that jesus has won for us father make this year a year of restoration for that person father that you restore them back to you first that they would walk with you they would talk with you and they would hear you say they are your own father i thank you for what you're doing in my life and the life of people here at Wilma Heights. We pray that you continue to do this work of restoration. That 2018, all that the enemy has stolen from us, Father, you will give it back to us double for all our trouble. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Oh, I'm glad you received that word this morning. Uh, we'd like to, for you to come and be part of the worship services here at Wilma Heights. We're located on 1687 Victoria Park Avenue, south of Lawrence, uh, here in Scarborough. And we have two services now. 
at 8 45 and 11 a.m and we want to take you deeper it's not the same one you're watching on the youtube but when you come in person the anointing is strong the anointing is huge and we want you to be part of this great revival of what god is doing here at Wilma heights and we believe for the best for you i we're still in our new year booster series and next week i have another wonderful message for you before then continue to do it again and god will give you the victory as you do it he will do it love you god bless you next week